Okay, very good. Okay, greetings and welcome to lecture four in our animal rights law course. In previous lectures, we've covered the sort of nature of animals, we talked about their sentience, we looked into the history of animal protection laws, and we sort of ended up focusing on both UK animal welfare law and EU welfare laws. And what we want to do in this lecture here, before in later lectures turning to the sort of issues with current welfare laws and sort of talking more about animal rights laws, we want to focus first on um, what other countries are doing in terms of animal protection laws, hence the title Comparative Animal Law. Here's an outline of what this lecture will cover. We'll start with a very brief global overview to give you a sense of sort of where different countries around the world stand with respect to animal protection law. Now, because we won't have time to cover all the 195 or so countries that exist, I want to focus with you on two specific countries, the United States and Switzerland, because I take them to be sort of contrasting examples as to um, how bad or how good a country um, can you know, regulate the situation of animals. And then I'll conclude with a few um, uh, remarks. Okay, let's start with this uh, brief global overview. Um, we are currently putting together a textbook and one of our research assistants has done some tremendous work going through the laws of all the different countries and you know, seeing actually what, what there is. And I think Sean used a similar graph last week and this one here is the same, just includes a bit more detail. So what our research assistant found was that 23% of all countries out of the 195, they don't have any animal protection laws whatsoever. These countries include, for instance, Angola, Iran, Kuwait and others. So 23% of all countries don't even have any kind of law that protects animals. Then 39% of all countries have at least what we've called in the previous lecture um, anti-cruelty laws or negative animal protection laws. Those are the ones, recall, that basically just um, impose prohibitions on the cruel treatment of animals, or they might say no unnecessary suffering. But it's only negative, if you like. It doesn't protect animals in a positive way, or it doesn't stipulate positive requirements as to how exactly animals should be treated. Countries um, with those types of laws only include Jamaica, Pakistan, South Africa, for instance. And then the last um, bit here, the last slice of our pie, are the, the countries that have both negative anti-cruelty laws as well as the more positive animal welfare laws, as we've called them. So laws that actually create requirements as to how animals need to be cared for, what type of food, water, etc., if they need companionship and all that. And that's 38%. And it includes not just the UK, as we saw last week, but also Chile, Germany, Costa Rica, other some other places as well. So this gives you a rough idea of where we are globally with animal protection law. Now, if you want to find out more about specific jurisdictions, there are two really good websites that we can recommend. The first one being the database that was compiled by the Global Animal Law Association, GAL, uh, which you can find using this link here. Essentially, they have all countries and all different types of legislation, including also constitutional laws if they exist, legislation, regulation, all sorts. It's a really useful resource if ever you were interested in just a specific jurisdiction or wanted to compare some. And then the second URL is that by the Animal Protection um, Index, or they call it the Index. Uh, this doesn't cover all countries. It focuses on 50 countries. But in contrast to uh, the first one, it actually compares the different jurisdictions and it basically ranks them and it has sort of different categories and you can see how, say, the UK ranks compared to, say, China. It's quite a useful tool um, and it goes into sort of 
does the country have, say, a recognition of sentience? Does it have a welfare act? Is it a member of um, the World Organization for Animal Health? A and other sort of criteria. It's quite useful, but again, it doesn't cover all countries, so you might not find a jurisdiction you're interested in. Okay, so this is the sort of rough overview. What I want to do now is start by focusing on the United States, which I think, and I think you will agree with me after the next couple of slides, is not the most robust system when it comes to animal protection. Now, as some of you may know, the US is a federal system. It's a federal state, um, unlike the UK, which is a more central state. This means that we can expect to find animal protection legislation not just on the federal level, the level of the United States as such, but also on the level of the individual states, the individual 50 states, which you see depicted here on this map. So we're going to go through the different federal laws that exist that protect animals or that at least sort of relate to animal protection. And we're also going to look at different state laws that exist and we're going to look at some um, uh, particularly interesting types of, of laws on the state level. Okay, starting with the federal level, so the level of the United States as such. The most important piece of legislation is the Animal Welfare Act from 1966. This act was created um, primarily with a view to regulating the transport, the selling of and the handling of animals intended for research, so scientific animals basically, or animals used for scientific purposes. However, to some degree, it also applies to um, other animals. The law is um, quite progressive in that already in 1966 it tried to set certain minimum requirements as to how these animals need to be housed, handled, um, what sorts of you know, nutrition they need and the veterinary care that needs to be provided for them. It also created a registration and licensing um, scheme whereby anyone, say a scientific um, researcher, handling animals would have to be registered and get a license from the state to do that. Before this act, this wasn't necessary. And then lastly, it also requires that all facilities um, have um, at least one veterinarian that regularly inspects facilities and tries to make sure that the animal's health is in accordance to what the Welfare Act requires. Now, the Act has a very important provision, which is this provision 2132, uh, which defines what it takes to be an animal. Right? Because it's an Animal Welfare Act, we need to know what counts as an animal whose welfare uh, is protected. Very importantly, and we don't need to go through the whole definition here, is the fact that definition excludes birds, rats, and mice that are bred for use in research. It also excludes horses, and it excludes other farm animals, right? So if you're a horse, or if, you're, if you are an animal on a farm, maybe a chicken, or if you're a mouse, then you are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act this Federal Animal Welfare Act. Now, why is that a problem? This graph here illustrates it very nicely. The dark gray bar here is the number or the percentage of animals used on and killed on farms, basically, used for food purposes. It's 98% of all animals used in the US. But as we just saw before, under this Subparagraph so 3 here, farm animals are excluded from the scope of protection of the Animal Welfare Act. So this whole big dark grey bar here is not covered by the protection of this Act. Which then leaves us with the tiny one here, the remaining 2%, if you will, used in research, testing, dissection for production, hunting in pounds. <laughs> 
But then the problem here, of course, is that, as we saw before, mice and rats are excluded from the scope of protection. And, of course, in scientific experiments, mice and rats are by far the uh, species that are used most often. In fact, they make up 99% of all animals used in experiments. So what we have then is a situation where we have an Animal Welfare Act in the US, but it doesn't apply to the 98% of animals that live on farms. And then the rem from the remaining 2%, it doesn't cover 99% of these remaining 2%. Right. So what we have then is a sort of a tiny sliver of animals that are actually covered by this Federal Animal Welfare Act. It's not the only law protecting animals on the federal level, however. Another law that was recently created is um, the Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act from 2019. Actually, when Sean and I started teaching this course, this law didn't exist yet. And we always said, well, the only place where you can find anti-cruelty laws in the strict sense are, is on the state level, not the federal level. This has changed with this Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act. It is the first such federal law. The Animal Welfare Act not actually including an anti-cruelty or unnecessary suffering provision. But the Act has a particular focus. It's not a sort of a general anti-cruelty law. And its focus is the criminalization of the so-called crushing of animals. Um, you may have heard of these videos that appeared years, uh, I think maybe 10 years or so ago, where essentially people with a sexual fetish would crush tiny animals, either like wearing high heels, or in other sorts of ways, um, really horrific videos. I've never seen one, and I'd rather not, and hopefully you won't ever. And what happened was in 2010, on the federal level, an act was created to criminalize the production and distribution of such videos, of such crush videos or crushing videos. And then nine years later, the actual act of committing the crushing, as it were, um, was um, criminalized as well um, because there was a sort of a feeling among um, Congress that just leaving it to the state level was not enough. We need a federal prohibition of this. What's really important, however, and this uh, sort of goes to why I said it, is, it has a limited focus, the Act tells us, the 2019 one that is, that it does not apply to customary animal husbandry slaughter for food, hunting, medical research, and other purposes. So essentially, if the sort of the crushing, if you will, or the cruel treatment of the animal, the torture, occurs as part of what is just normal in animal husbandry, in raising animals for food, say, in using them for a medical research, then this is not covered by the Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act, only what happens outside of customary animal husbandry. So as long as it's sort of normal in the process of these things, then it is not cruelty as far as this act is concerned. We're going to come back to this notion of customary animal practices um, because it is a really problematic one as far as animal protection is concerned. Okay, there are some more laws on the federal level, um, but they sort of reduce in importance uh, as we go through the slides. The next one here is the Humane Slaughter Act, uh, which dates from 1958. This act only focuses on sort of protecting animals at the time of slaughter, so not at the time of sort of, you know, raising them on the farm. And what it tells us is that... Um, Slaughter methods need to be used that are humane, which essentially means that animals have to be stunned, they have to be anesthetized, rendered insensible to pain before they are killed. However, note that, as is the case with many other legal systems, including the UK, there is an exemption here for ritual slaughter. So if you're slaughtering animals, say, to obtain a kosher meat or halal meat, then you don't need to render 
um, the animal insensible to pain before killing it. This particular act applies to livestock animals, cattle, calves, horses, mules, sheep, and others. But it excludes a very important category, and that's chickens. And again, why is excluding chickens such a big problem? We encounter again a similar sort of situation as we have before with the Animal Welfare Act. This chart here, um, made by the United States Department of Agriculture, shows you the um, types of species used or slaughtered, I should say. The red bar being chickens. The tiny blue and green and what have you bars um, are other species of animals, including cattle, ducks, and others. And even though their absolute numbers are quite high too, or were in 2008, and that's the most recent uh, such graph I could find, um, you can see how chickens um, just far outnumber all other types of, spe of species. And they are not covered by the Humane Slaughter Act. So all these protections, the humane slaughter, etc., does not need to be respect it when it comes to slaughtering chickens. Another law, seemingly arcane but still in force and doing some good work, is the 28-hour law from 1877. This law provides that animals must not be transported across state lines um, for more than 28 hours without taking a break of at least five hours to feed the animals, water them, and give them a bit of a rest. Now, as you can see here from the quote in the middle of this paragraph, um, since it's quite an ancient law, it said that the transport has to be using rail carrier, express carrier, or common carrier. And until 2006, the USDA did not actually interpret this sentence as applying to trucks, and of course, trucks were the most commonly used way of transporting animals. And hence, trucks didn't have to respect this, and they could drive for 30 hours, 35, 40 hours if they wanted to. Now, since 2006, the USDA has changed this practice and now also applies the law to trucks. You may have also heard of the Endangered Species Act from 1973. This was a sort of part of the package of green legislation created under the Nixon administration, which has been doing a lot of good work, um, but its aim is to protect endangered and threatened species from extinction. It does not protect individual animals per se, so the focus is on groups, on species, rather than on, say, preventing individual animals from suffering. So we're not going to be focusing on this um, particular law anymore, but it's um, important to mention in the context. Okay, so we've covered the federal laws that exist in the US and that protect, um, at least in some minimal ways, animals. Let us now sort of move one level down to states and see what they have in store for animals. States um, have actual anti-cruelty statutes, so the negative ones that we've been talking about before that try to um, prevent um, unnecessary suffering from being inflicted on animals. These types of statutes, it depends on the state, of course, but on the whole, they apply to all sorts of animals. They don't have a specific focus, say, animals used in scientific experiments. As I just alluded to, they generally prohibit unnecessary suffering from being imposed on animals. They frame it in different ways, depending on the law, but that's roughly the message. Importantly, they are criminal laws, not administrative laws. This means that they need to be essentially prosecuted by the police and public prosecutors. There's no state agency that is tasked with enforcing these laws, which 
is usually a problem for animals for the reasons that Sean has mentioned before, public prosecutors, police, they've, uh, they've got other things to do and they like to prioritize human-related crimes, whereas um, agencies specifically created for the purpose of protecting or enforcing animal laws um, would be more suited for the purpose, but they are generally not available in the states because these anti-cruelty statutes are criminal statutes it is a felony or it is a misdemeanor to treat an animal cruelly, etc. Okay, that's the sort of general um, overview of what anti-cruelty statutes do. Now, I want to come back to a point that I mentioned before that we've come across when we talked about the federal anti-cruelty law or the anti-crushing law that now exists. And that's the fact that many of these state laws, they exempt normal, so-called normal farming practices um, either completely or at least partially. Now, what does this mean? Let's have a look at a concrete um, law to see how this, this plays out in, in, in practice. So this is from Nevada. Nevada has um, a statute that um, relates to cruelty done to animals. And it starts off in a really good way. It says, a person shall not torture or unjustifiably maim, mutilate, or kill an animal kept for companionship or pleasure, um, a cat or a dog, except as otherwise provided in paragraph A, overdrive, overload, torture, cruelly beat, or unjustifiably injure, maim, mutilate, or kill an animal. So using different, you know, sorts of, of terms, it basically says you must not impose unnecessary suffering on an animal. You must not treat an animal cruelly. But then it goes on to say in the subsequent paragraph that the provisions, including the provision that we just looked at, do not prohibit or interfere with established methods of animal husbandry, including the raising, handling, feeding, housing, and transporting of livestock or farm animals. So essentially what this says is, if you are a farmer, and if you are raising your animals in a way that corresponds to how other farmers are raising their animals, then by definition, this is not considered cruel under Nevada's revised statutes, regardless of whether perhaps objectively it might be cruel or not, right? So as long as it's done by everyone, it is fine, essentially. And that's, of course, a huge concession to the industry, right? If in other sectors this was possible, we would have, you know, huge problems. If, I don't know, chemical companies were allowed to do whatever is normal among chemical companies, then we might have some problems, right? So it's almost as if the industry was regulating itself here, which is due to the fact that especially farming has a big lobby in the US as well as in other, in other countries. So these are these normal farming um, practices, exemptions, um, again, similar to the one we saw before on the federal level. Another interesting fact about um, the U.S. state laws are that some of them contain so-called ag-gag law, so ag standing for agricultural. The aim of these laws, and I think we briefly talked about those um, in our Q&A last time, is to make it illegal for someone to enter a farm and to obtain unauthorized recordings from that farm and then usually what happens is these recordings are distributed so the idea is undercover investigations done by animal welfare animal rights activists who um, frustrated you know with the situation say normal farming practices and all that they want to get access to a farm maybe they say I want to work here they work there for a few weeks and this has happened um, numerous times, they took undercover uh, footage and then released it to the media and then was public outcry and laws were changed as a result 
The industry, again, being very powerful, pushed against this, and in several states was successful in having state legislatures introduce these types of ag gag laws, making it a crime not to treat animals cruelly, but to make recordings of the cruel treatment of animals. And these laws sometimes can carry heavier penalties, in fact, as the cruel treatment of animals, ironically. Okay, I have an example of one of these laws for you here. This is from Alabama. It says here, it shall be unlawful for any person to do any of the following. Obtain access to an animal or crop facility by false pretenses. Break and enter into any animal or crop facility with intent to obtain unauthorized possession of records. So basically just record what's going on, data, materials, equipment, even animals or crops. So maybe animal liberation type exercises would be covered by this too. Or even just possess or use records, materials, data, equipment, or crops or animals. If you know, or at least reasonably could have believed that these things were um, obtained by theft or deception. So say if you're a newspaper and if you get this type of footage, you might reasonably believe or know that it was obtained in violation of this code, in which case you would be um, subject to a penalty. The American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty Against Animals created this useful map here. And what you can see is where ACAG laws have been ruled unconstitutional. That's the green one. So in a number of states, what we've seen is these ACAG laws have been challenged on freedom of speech grounds. Because obviously freedom of speech allows you to record stuff to possess information, data, videos, to distribute them, to go to the press, talk to the press. This is all protected by the First Amendment. And um, animal rights organizations have been quite successful in the US in challenging these ACAG laws on freedom of speech grounds. So where there's a green one, there was an ACAG law that existed, but it was basically struck down by the Constitutional Court or a similar court. Um, the red one, the ACAG defeated, are states where in the political process ACAG laws were proposed but they were not successful because there was enough political pushback. And then this one here, we have ACAG laws that were passed and are still in force. So a, a number of states and there's some states where litigation is currently pending where the status isn't clear. Now it's worth um, noting also that you can find these ACAG laws not just in the US, but also in some other states. They also exist in Canada, for instance. So it's not just a US phenomenon. Okay, if you have any questions about this, we can talk about it later in the Q&A. But I'd like to turn to another um, jurisdiction now, and that's Switzerland. I am myself from Switzerland, so <laughs> the reason why I've included it is not just for patriotic reasons. I'm not a particular patriot. Um, but I do think Switzerland actually has a generally, um, genuinely good system of protection for animals, at least relatively speaking, and definitely compared to the US. Okay, so Switzerland, like the US, is a federal state, so we can expect um, laws protecting animals on the federal level. Switzerland has a codified constitution, and it mentions animals there and it has some legislation also pertaining to animals, and we're going to be looking at um, those pieces of legislation. Switzerland, being a federal state, um, also has state laws, um, or cantonal laws, as they're called in Switzerland, state, canton, and you see them listed here. Um, however, for reasons that we'll discuss, state law isn't quite as important as it is in the US, but there's still some interesting cantonal um, particularities or peculiarities that we can have a look at. Okay, let's start with Swiss federal law. The Swiss constitution has two provisions that are really important and interesting and that relate to animals. 
The first one is Article 80, which creates the federal competence for animal protection. And I've also reprinted Article 80 here in English. It says here that the Confederation, which is just another word for the federal government, shall legislate on the protection of animals. Right? So the Constitution here tells the government, hey, you are responsible for protecting animals, right? And this being included in the Constitution, it is recognized as a constitutional goal, if you will. Right? Gives the competence to government, you have to do this. Then in paragraph two, it says what particular things should be included in the legislation. So enacted, say, keeping and caring of animals, how experiments are done, how animals are used, import, trading, as well as slaughter of animals. Now, the third paragraph here is quite important um, because it goes to something I briefly alluded to before, and that's the fact that the enforcement of regulations or the laws created by the federal government is the responsibility of the canton. Really what this tells us here, um, but not in so many words, is that the cantons do not have the competence to enact animal welfare legislation, animal protection legislation, or anti-cruelty statutes, as we've seen in the US, where the states have the competence, the power to do so. The idea is that the federal government should do it, create a more harmonized set of legislation, rather than having a sort of a, 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 a puzzle, a sort of patchwork situation like in the US where it differs from state to state. Cantons here are only supposed to enforce the federal animal protection laws. So it's, of course, it's also much smaller, so it's easier for us to do. Here's the second very important constitutional provision. This is actually unique. Um, there's no other country that has this type of constitutional provision. And it's the dignity of living beings, which is provided for by Article 120, Paragraph 2 of the Federal Constitution. This provision tells us in its um, second paragraph that the Confederation, again the federal government, shall legislate on the use of reproductive and genetic material from animals, plants and other organisms. And now comes the important bit. In doing so, it shall take account of the dignity of living beings as well as the safety of human beings, animals and the environment. It will take account of the dignity of living beings. Now, what exactly does this mean? It has been interpreted and also created with that particular meaning in mind as to protect the inherent value, the inherent dignity of individual animals, not just groups or species of animals, plants, possibly even other living beings. So it is very broad, but it definitely includes the dignity of animals. Switzerland has a sort of constitutional principle that says that every constitutional provision is of the same rank. And so as a result, in principle, this dignity provision has the same rank as, say, a human being's right to life. So it has a very high rank, if you will, or very low, depending on how you look at it. But they all have the same rank. Also, what's important for us to note is that even though um, Article 120 talks about sort of genetic material, um, and that is the context in which this provision was created. It is now considered to be a general constitutional principle, also applicable outside of the sort of um, gene technology context. So throughout Swiss law, the dignity of animals needs to be respected. But what exactly does it mean? So, currently, as far as sort of the doctrine is concerned and case law, it is not taken to be an individual right of an animal. Right? So, an animal doesn't have a right to dignity in the sense that it or a representative of the animal could claim dignity and say, oh, this chicken um, cannot be used for food production because it has a right to dignity. This does not work. There is also some discussion as to whether, and the sort of predominant view is that 
This right is just relative, meaning that it can be traded off against more important human interests. Right? So human dignity is considered to be absolute. That is, it can never be traded off against um, other interests, whereas animal dignity can. So take the example again of scientific research. If the view um, sort of dominates that um, it is more important from the point of view of gaining scientific knowledge to use an animal for scientific research. And even if the animal has dignity, that is justified. It is just a relative um, dignity, if you like. In contrast to humans, who, of course, could never be used for scientific experiments because it would, it would violate their human dignity, their absolute dignity. There has, however, been some discussion of late as to whether the animals' right or the animals' um, dignity protection, I should say, might not at least have an inviolable core, right? So the Jerry Bolliger piece that was on the reading list for today tries to make this argument. It essentially says, okay, maybe, uh, maybe some aspect of the dignity protection is relative. It can be traded off against other human interests. But if dignity is supposed to mean anything, and it, if it's supposed to have a similar meaning to the word dignity when it's used for human dignity, then it should at least have a core that is absolute, that cannot be limited under any circumstances. And it's a matter of debate what could be part of that core, maybe sort of a right not to be inflicted, sort of torture, um, maybe a right to life. Now, this is sort of, you know, scholarly speculation at this stage. So, dominant view is that it is just a, a relative right. But it's an interesting discussion that is currently being had. Okay, moving one level down, we have the Animal Welfare Act from 2008. There was a previous act, but the act was revised in 2008, hence the relatively recent date. Contains around 40 articles, and it is an act that, like the UK um, Welfare Act, is concretized in regulations particularly the animal welfare ordinance as well as some other ordinances. These just basically put more flesh on the bones, um, to use politically incorrect metaphor in this context, um, of the Animal Welfare Act and tries to spell out what it means exactly. And the animal welfare ordinances, um, it does contain some really interesting protections. For instance, recently, I think is the first country in the world, Switzerland, created a ban of killing lobsters without prior stunning. So you can't boil lobsters anymore, basically, to eat them. Or you can, but they have to be stunned before. Now, this act applies to vertebrates, cephalopods, crustaceans. So it has a fairly um, broad scope of application, but in theory, it doesn't apply to all animals. And it doesn't sort of discriminate um, as far as um, different purposes for which animals are used are concerned. So it applies to farmed animals as well as laboratory animals, wild animals, in contrast to the US Animal Welfare Act, as we saw. Now, what does it do? It, on the one hand, contains unnecessary suffering um, prohibitions. So it contains the anti-cruelty laws, as we've been calling them. It uses a balancing standard, as does the UK um, law as well. What exactly is suffering that is justified? We have to sort of balance the animal's interest against the interests of the humans. But then it also protects animals' well-being in more positive ways. So it, it is also an animal welfare law. For instance, it says that um, you know, animals must be able to live in a healthy way according to the needs of their species. And importantly, the Act also tells us more about animal dignity. Because it was just on a constitutional level before, right? So now it is put into legislation, it is concretized. In fact, the Act starts off by saying that the whole purpose of this law is to protect the dignity and welfare of animals, right? So we go even beyond welfare now and say that animals have this dignity and the law is here to protect it. But what exactly does dignity mean? Article 3 tells us more about it. 
It says that dignity means the inherent worth of the animal that must be respected when dealing with it. If any strain imposed on the animal cannot be justified by overriding interest, this constitutes a disregard for the animal's dignity. What you have here is the idea that animal dignity is just relative, right? It could, in principle, be justified to override it in certain circumstances. So this is um, basically conceded here. Strain is deemed to be present in particular if pain, suffering, or harm is inflicted on the animal, if it is exposed to anxiety or humiliation, if there is major interference with its appearance or its abilities, or if it is excessively instrumentalized. These three concepts are quite important, so let's have a closer look at them. Okay, so we have a law that, that doesn't just protect animals from suffering and not just protects their welfare, but goes beyond and tries to protect them from injuries against their integrity in three ways. So we have humiliation. Ex an example that Bolliger gives is basically dressing up animals in funny costumes where the animals basically just made an object for our amusement. Excessive instrumentalization. An example here is animals that are cloned and then basically used for scientific research. And the idea here is that, again, you treat the animal just as a pure object. You disregard its um, inherent value, its inherent interests that it might have. Now, we all instrumentalize animals. I think that's the idea here. So if I go for a walk with my dog just because I want to get some exercise, I might instrumentalize the dog in some way. But I also see the dog as having intrinsic interests, intrinsic value that are worth protecting and Jerry Bolliger at least suggests that with the cloning of animals used for scientific research, there's no respect for this intrinsic value. They're just treated as objects, basically, that can be multiplied. And then lastly, we have the example of substantial interference with animals' appearance or ability. So this is the example of the Sphinx cat. I'm not sure if you've seen those before. Um, they're bred in a way that they don't have any hair or fur and don't have whiskers, I think, either. And they're really good for people with allergies. But the idea being you so interfere with the abilities, key abilities of an animal, that it amounts to just treating them as mere objects, basically. Now, what's important to note again is that dignity protection is an absolute right. So the example of humiliation in particular, as well as the other instances, can in principle be justified as long as we find sufficiently important human interests, right? So if you think you know, dressing up the dog or carrying out scientific experiments or having cats that, um, you know, don't sort of cause allergic reactions in people is important enough to breed these animals in that way or dress them up that way, then that is legal. That is fine, right? So don't take the dignity provision to suggest that all of this would be illegal. It's just that we have to balance here and we might end up with the conclusion that some of these things are not justified. Okay. Very briefly, we have also a dereification clause in the Swiss Civil Code, and this will be of interest to Brendan, who asked the question about this before. So this is an example of how some countries try to unthink animals. I think that's how you've called it, haven't you, Brendan? Um, so provision 641 tells us that animals are not objects. Sounds really good. You might think, oh, maybe they're legal persons now. Not quite. Because paragraph two tells us that where no special provisions exist for animals, they are subject to the provisions governing objects, right? And the special provisions being, for instance, the Animal Welfare Act, the Animal Welfare Ordinance. So again, it, it sounds great, but it's been seen as being more of symbolic importance because you end up with a similar situation as you have in the UK, for instance, where there's no sort of express deification of animals but the legal system um, treats animals in exactly the same way, subject to the provisions governing objects where there is no specific laws protecting them. Okay, very briefly, on the cantonal level, as I said, there are no substantive laws, but because cantons are um, uh, responsible for enforcing federal welfare laws, uh, we've seen some interesting developments. In the canton of Zurich, for instance, there was an animal attorney for two decades 
who, similar to the RSPCA here, um, could privately enforce the law. And he could step in where the animal um, sort of agency was not sufficiently um, you know, making sure that the Welfare Act is being enforced. He could step in. He could bring prosecution against private individuals. He could even appeal against criminal sentences or sort of uh, acquittals if he thought they weren't justified. It was abolished for reasons we can go into if you're interested. And then lastly, um, in the canton of Basel Stadt, um, which is a very small canton, a popular initiative has been um, launched, and I've been a sort of legal advisor to this, where a new provision is being proposed for the fundamental rights, the basic rights catalogue of the constitution of that canton. Now, popular initiative, just for those of you who don't know, Switzerland is a sort of direct democracy, so people can vote in referendums on constitutional amendments all the time. It's like a ballot initiative in the US. And here the proposal is that the right of non-human primates to life and bodily and mental integrity should be recognized, as well as humans' fundamental rights, which are already in there. Now, there has been a sort of a legal, um, there's been sort of litigation against this, but the initiative has been validated or was validated by the Swiss Federal Supreme Court in 2020. We can go into the sort of the legal arguments if you're interested in this, but the sort of the main point you need to take away from this is that in 2022, the citizens of Baselstadt will be the first ones in the world who can decide in a sort of direct democratic vote whether they want to recognize um, the right to life and bodily and mental integrity of non-human primates, right? So, because human primates already have those rights. Very briefly to wrap up, we've seen that there are significant differences in the level of protection that different jurisdictions have. And I took the US and Switzerland as a sort of contrast because of how different they are. But there's many countries sort of in the middle between those countries. We saw the issue with exceptions and limited scopes of application. So even where you have a really nice law, it's not of much use if it doesn't provide protection for really important categories of animals as far as um, their numbers are concerned and how they're used. We saw the power of corporate lobbyists in creating laws that may seem absurd. But also we've seen the importance that public pressure can have, media attention, and how there's an interplay also between these lobbyists and uh, people who are trying to change the laws by getting um, uh, the public to be more aware of, of some of the problems with these laws. Great. I think we can end it here. Um, and if you have any questions, we can talk about them in the Q&A. Thank you.